Well, hi. So in the second part of this workshop, we're now going to have a couple of sessions on metagenomics. Uh, each session will last an hour, and in each one I will start off with an introductory talk, which is what I'm going to do now for the first of the two sessions. So the first thing when we're talking about metagenomes and microbiomes is that we should just forget all about the human genome, uh, which has hogged the limelight for the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, and focus all our efforts on, in fact, this complex, very rich community of microbes that inhabits our bodies and lives on our surface of our bodies and contains thousands of times more genes than our nuclear genome. This community of microbes, uh, along with their associated genes and genomes, make up the human microbiome. And in particular, the human gut microbiome is one of the most complex known microbial communities. Uh, there are around a thousand different species uh, in the human gut microbiome. Each one of us is carrying several hundred of those species uh, on an individual basis. And if we look at any of us, we're carrying a hundred times more bacterial cells than there are stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And if you take all of the humans on the planet together, well, seven billion of us, we're carrying as many bacterial cells as there are stars in the known universe. So, so the figures really are astronomical here when we're dealing with the, with the human uh, microbiome, and particularly the human gut microbiome. You'll often hear people say that there are 10 times as many uh, bacterial cells associated with our bodies as there are traditional human cells. A couple of years ago that figure was actually revised and a new estimate came in. Um, and it all depends on what you're calling a human cell. So if you call red cells, which don't have a nucleus, if you call those red blood cells um, human cells, um, then there are about 25 times 10 to the 12 of those associated with our bodies. Um, and then there are about 5 times 10 to the 12 conventional nucleated cells. Uh, you compare that with bacteria, there are about 38 times 10 to the 12 bacteria. So from one point of view, if you, if you include the red cells, then there's a little bit more bacterial cells uh, than there are human cells. If you exclude the red cells and just focus on the nuclear cells, then we're know, something like seven or eight times um, as many um, uh, bacterial cells as there are human cells. And the human gut microbiome has many uh, functions. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but it's, it has protective functions, structural functions, metabolic functions, all of which are crucial to the balance between health and disease uh, in humans and indeed similarly in animals their gut microbiota to play the same kind of roles. And one key paper that changed the way people think was this one here from 12 years ago which set the scene for the microbiome actually being involved in a whole range of diseases and clinical conditions that we wouldn't normally think of as being microbial in origin. So um, whether you have a, a, a bit of a middle-aged spread like I do and you're, you're rather more fat on your waistline than you'd like, well now it's clear that the microbiome is playing a role in that, in this um, body weight homeostasis. Um, and this was kicked off by this paper from Jeff Gordon and others saying that there was a specific obesity associated gut microbiome that had an increased capacity for energy harvest. Um, and there's a lot of interest now in the role of the microbiome in all sorts of other conditions as well. In my own group we got interested in this a few years ago when we were using metagenomics as an approach, exploring its use in a kind of diagnostic setting. So there was an outbreak of, e of an E. coli in Germany and we got involved early on and we had a paper based on genome sequencing the outbreak strain and what you did for that was to actually culture the organism from the faeces as, sh as shown here and then uh, once you had a pure culture extract DNA and sequence it to get the genome sequence. But in our subsequent study we set ourselves the challenge of could we go from the faecal sample directly to the sequence so we could just extract DNA from the faecal sample and get to the same understanding of the outbreak strain um, without having to culture the organism and this set in motion what we might call the process of diagnostic metagenomics. And, and here in, 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 in this approach, um, 
which is an example of what we call shotgun metagenomics. What we're doing is taking that complex mixture of microbes, not trying to subculture them out and isolate them in pure culture, not even trying to fractionate the cells, but we just extract the DNA from all of them en masse, and then we do the heavy lifting once we have the sequences. And the heavy lifting is done at the bioinformatic stage, where you then try and work out which of those sequences belong to which organisms and what those sequences might tell you about the function of those organisms in that complex microbial community. So uh, in a sense when we're doing metagenomics, this whole cell genome sequencing, uh, uh, DNA sequencing of the DNA from complex communities en masse, we're asking these three questions. Who's there? Um, and that's what we uh, address when we're doing taxonomic assignments, taxonomic profiling. What are those organisms doing uh, and, and how are they doing it? That's more in the functional side of things and that will be the second part of this, um, these, these two sessions on metagenomics. So in the first stage we're going to look at who is there. Um, this is a, a, another uh, flowchart that just shows you the kinds of things you can do in, 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 in microbiota, microbiome analyses. Uh, you can do functional analysis, we're not going to say much about that. You can also do culturing or culturomics, it's high throughput culturing, uh, and we're not going to say much about that either, but that is a, an emerging field where it's clear that many of these organisms, despite what people were saying a few years ago, that most of them resisted culture, they can be cultured if you try hard enough. But what we're going to focus on now is the middle one, which is actually metagenomic analysis. And, um, and that can be divided into these two arms, metagenomics per se, shotgun metagenomics, and 16S sequencing. I'm not going to say much about 16 or anything about 16S sequencing because this is, is now a, a decidedly 20th century technology and all the smart money is now on using shotgun metagenomics. 16S is rather uh, constrained in what it can actually tell you about the, uh, the species that are in your sample and the functions that they might be playing and you can gain an awful lot more by doing metagenomics per se. And this, again, subdivides into functional inferences and actually taxonomic and phylogenetic analyses. Here's another flow chart showing you the kind of things you can do. Um, and you've got the functional assignments, assemblies, and so forth. But we're gonna, uh, we're gonna focus in this session on taxonomic classification where you can get taxonomic profiles of the organisms that are present. Now you could do taxonomic assignment exhaustively by looking at all the genes that are there and trying to work out where they come from. But that is, it is possible, but it's slow and onerous and it uses an awful lot of computer capacity. So what most people are doing now, at least to start with, uh, is a much quicker approach which relies on what we call CAMAs. Now the term CAMA is a perhaps overly complicated term uh, for what is actually a very simple concept. It's basically uh, a string of characters in the DNA um, defined by their length. So a kama uh, has a length k, so a tumour would have a, uh, a length of two characters, a, a 15 ma would have a length of 15 characters. And what the, this kind of approach to taxonomic assignment using kamas does is it creates a list of all the kamas of a particular length um, and it then queries a, uh, a database of sequences that have already been assigned of complete genomes that have already been given a taxonomic assignment and it works out which kamas belong where in the uh, taxonomy tree, the phylogenetic tree uh, of those uh, reference sequences. So at the top there that purple Kama, that might be something that's found in all living organisms or, or say in all bacteria. So maybe one of those conserved strings that you get in a 16S sequence would sit there and if you see that you can say well this is cellular life uh, but it's not, it's not viruses or anything like that. cellular life but we can't say any more than that because it's present in everything. And as you go down the tree you say the red one there that might be saying well this is E. coli uh, and it's only found in E. coli. Um, but it's found in all E. coli, so if we see that, we can say, yep, you've got E. coli present. Um, and you can fill in the gaps in between, uh, the various nodes in between, with phylum and uh, class, order, family, and so forth as you go down. 
So here's one example of the output from the common, commonly used program Kraken. In this context, Kraken's actually not being used for metagenomics, but as a quality control step when doing whole genome sequencing. So here the individuals working on this project have thought that they've, they think they've got some Staph aureus that they've cultured in the lab, uh, and they think they've got a pure culture, and they've extracted DNA and they want to sequence it. And they want to check, is what they're looking at what they think it is? And what you can see here is that it, it is indeed that 95% of the sequences in there, uh, in, in their sample, have been assigned by Kraken to uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And so that is uh, a very promising result. Uh, what you've got here is actually these five columns. In the first column, you've got the percentage of reads that have been assigned at a particular taxonomic level. And you can see the taxonomic levels in, in column four there, uh, they, what, they, what their, uh, uh, the, the actual taxon level is. So uh, you've got their domain, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Um, and what uh, Kraken is doing is it's saying in, in columns two and three, it's saying this is a number of reads that I can assign to that particular taxonomic level. I mean, in the first column, it's saying these are the number of reads that can be assigned at that level. And in three, it's saying these are the number of reads that can be assigned at level, that level and no further down the tree. So you can see there that um, you've got f f uh, 159,892 reads that have been assigned to cellular organisms, but none of them just sit at that level because all of them are actually classified also as bacteria. And that's probably because they've only used a bacterial library um, in, in to devise their, 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 the library they use for, for, for the Kraken analysis. Um, the, the other uh, column there, five, which we haven't spoken about, is actually the number given in the, the uh, GenBank, the, the PubMed um, NCBI taxonomy assigned to that particular uh, taxonomic group. Here's a similar kind of analysis, but things haven't gone quite so well here. The people thought they were analysing an Enterococcus and genome sequencing it, but only 60 odd percent of their reads are actually being assigned to Enterococcus, only just over 50 to a particular species, Enterococcus faecalis. Um, and instead, what they're seeing here is that around 30 percent of their reads are instead being assigned, if you scroll down, to a different phylum entirely, Actinobacteria, and within that phylum, Actinobacteria, the vast majority of them have actually been assigned to the genus Mycobacterium and to the, uh, in fact, to the species Mycobacterium abscessus. So instead of getting a, a pure culture of an Enterococcus, in fact, they've got a mixture here of Mycobacterium abscessus mixed in with an Enterococcus, which is bad news for them. One thing I forgot to say, when we look at this Staph aureus, you might be saying, well, why isn't 100% of your reads assigned to Staph aureus? Um, and that may be explained by the fact that, that this is only as good as the libraries you're using and what those libraries contain and what's actually been seen in the cumulative human uh, knowledge to date. So it may be that in that Staph aureus that you've isolated there's a plasmid that's never been seen in Staph aureus before. Uh, it has been seen but it's been seen in another organism say in Enterococcus or in a Craglase negative Staphylococcus. Um, and so those 5% of reads will have been misclassified as belonging to a different taxon uh, because of those kind of artefacts there, and this, these changes in the accessory genome. So this is what uh, it looks like if you analyse a much more complex microbial community. This is a stool sample that's been analysed. And here you can see that, again, we're getting 99% of reads, luckily, are assigned to cellular organisms, and the vast majority of them can be assigned to bacteria. And about half the reads come in as Firmicutes, the gram-positive phylum, uh, and the major vast majority of them are actually classified to, uh, to one class within that, that phylum, the Clostridia. Um, uh, but if you scroll down, if you work down to the species level, you can see there we've got 17.33% that come in as Ruminococcus brangii. Um, uh, but if you then go down further, you've got 2.38% are being assigned to Fecalibacterium prosnetzii, and a bit further down, you're starting to get at the species level, Ruinoclostridium thermocellulum, 
um, there you, you just got one read associated with that, which is obviously a very much more tentative assignment. Does it actually mean that organism is there or is that a misassignment? Uh, you go further down, you get into the Lachnospheraceae as a family and the genius Plautia, where you've got 8.65%. Uh, so you can work your way down the list and you can go all the way down to the rare microbiome where you're getting only like say 0.04% of reads associated with Lactobacillus crispatus. Um, and some of these reads, again, you have to use your critical judgment. You can see there that 0.29% of the reads have been associated with Campylobacter jejuni. Now that's a, a human pathogen. See, we wouldn't expect that to be just a colonizing organism in a stool sample. So that begs the question, is this, is this really from a patient who's got uh, Campylobacter jejuni causing infection? Or are those reads being misassigned? And one would have to look a lot further into that to be certain what's going on. Here's uh, some, uh, just the, the headline organisms that we found in a range of stool samples from intensive care pa unit patients, critically ill patients. And what we were surprised to find that in these stool samples, in many cases, um, the, the most uh, predominant, the most abundant organisms in terms of the, the read assignments were actually headline pathogens like Klebsiella pneumoniae, Enterococcus fecium or Stenotrophomonas multifilia uh, are taking up a considerable portion of, of that gut microbiota. So in one of those samples there, over 50% of the reads have been assigned to Enterococcus fecium. And this is a sign that these are not healthy but very sick microbiota where these pathogens have bloomed up and taken over um, and predominated in a way that you wouldn't see in a healthy situation. Um, here's one uh, example of a uh, patient that we followed up over several stool, stool samples and what you can see is they started out uh, when we look at the percentage of reads associated particular taxa with a fairly diverse and probably quite healthy looking uh, gut microbiota but about halfway through the slide suddenly the, the microbiota gets overtaken by this Enterococcus, Enterococcus fecium uh, which predominates and takes over maybe 90% of the reads and 90% probably of the cells in, in this microbiota, um, which is quite a dreadful, sick uh, microbiota. And probably is a predictor that this patient might then go on to get an infection um, in the bloodstream or soft tissues or in lines or whatever with this particular organism. It's worth stressing that it's not quite what you see is what you get when you do these microbiota samples uh, and studies, the metagenomic studies. You have to take into account uh, various factors, use your critical judgment on things. So the number of reads that you see in your metagenomic analysis may not scale perfectly with the number of cells in the original sample. Genomes vary in size. So if we had a mixture of, say, mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, even if they're in equal amounts in terms of cells, we would expect to see perhaps 10 times as many reads in terms of the sequences because the mycobacterial genome is 10 times larger than that of the mycoplasma one. But then the other complicating factor though is that mycobacteria are actually the toughest, among the toughest organisms to crack their cells open and so um, we may end up not getting all the DNA out of the mycobacteria and so we may only get half the DNA or maybe 20% of the DNA Whereas with the things like mycoplasma, they're very easy to crack open, uh, we would expect to see the vast majority of the DNA. So it becomes quite hard to predict quite how that scales, you know, the genome size, the ability of the cells to be lysed and so forth. The other problem is that the taxonomic classifiers that we use, they're only as good as the sequence libraries and the annotation they're drawing on. Um, so we already mentioned this problem with the Staph aureus plasmid might be misidentified. Uh, what, what is a particular uh, bugbear of mine is that you, you, you see Shigella uh, uh, being d uh, classified there, reads assigned to Shigella in a, in a sample. And we know that Shigella actually is just a subcategory, a pathovar of E. coli, and it's a human specific pathovar. So if you're, say, looking at, I don't know, chicken gut, for example, and you get a load of reads assigned to Shigella, you have to say, no, nah, no, that's not really Shigella. I don't believe that. That's just a, 
an E. coli that's living in that, in, in that uh, gut that's been misassigned. And you have to use your critical faculties there. Another yeah. particular problem is the so-called ketone, the fact that in fact you get uh, DNA sequences carried over from your reagents, from the kits that you're using. Uh, here's a paper from a couple of years ago where they were trying to find infectious agents um, using DNA sequencing in, in serum and plasma samples from humans. And they showed that yes, they could detect DNA from some true positives, E. coli, scrub typhus, and dengue. But these guys were savvy. They didn't just interpret their data in a very naive fashion. They realized that there were a whole load of false positives. And what they actually found was a kitchen sink's worth of, of uh, false positives. So they carefully looked to see what was present in, in, in some samples, what was present in all samples. Uh, and you can see at the back there, things like Acromobacter and Autoimmunus present in all their samples. And this phage, Phi X174, found in all their samples. And that doesn't make any sense in a, in a clinical context. And they therefore quite sensibly dismiss this as contamination. But then if you look at the front of, the, uh, of, of these heat maps here, you can see that they say that dengue virus is present in only two of their samples. And that is actually much more plausible. So you have to use your critical judgment in interpreting this and take into account that contamination is a problem when you're doing sequencing. Um, and a key paper that actually pointed all this out was from uh, Zana Salter a few years ago um, where she, she said that this was a big problem that both in 16S surveys but in shotgun metagenomics as well you can get uh, reagent and laboratory contamination causing big problems. And here's a tweet from Nick Lohman last year quoting a paper that I wrote a couple of lines from it there where I say that uh, potential concern is the growth of a wild frontier of microbiome, microbiome genome and microbiome analyses performed by non-experts hand cranking the data through pipelines they don't fully understand they're naively interpreting the results without engaging the healthy skepticism of the seasoned expert and what I point out is that eternal vigilance is likely to be the price of containing the micro the equivalent of microbial genomic astrology um, and this is a, an issue in running your own research programs and looking at your own results but also a problem that everyone who's doing peer review should take into account do you actually believe those results that have come out of that particular study or is it likely to be misinterpretation contamination and other artifacts more generally there is a risk when you're doing microbiome research that your work gets overplayed uh, oversold and this guy, Jonathan Eisen, the American uh, microbiome specialist, has taken a lot of effort in actually uh, cataloging and, and in fact giving an award to, to uh, papers and press releases that oversell the microbiome. Um, and this is a big problem. Um, there's a good book that's just come out if you're interested in microbiome research uh, by Ed Young. Um, and it is clear that the microbiome has been associated with a whole range of different diseases, the gut microbiome in particular, you can see there. But, uh, you know, you can look at this uh, rather critically, though, in some of the overhyped claims. So that cartoon there suggesting it's not you that's to blame when you go and go down in the middle of the night and get that cake out of the fridge and overeat. It's not you, it's your microbiome is the hidden puppet master. And you have no free will at all. It's all down to your microbiome. And microbiome research is actually being taken in to the public domain and, and people are just doing things for themselves, the general public. Uh, there's all the, these uh, reports now of women uh, taking uh, their, their vaginal microbiota and smearing it over the face of babies that have been born by caesarean section because they believe it will actually be health, health, healthy and helpful for them. But of course there is the risk that if they're carrying pathogens in their vaginal microbiome, they may be transferring pathogens as well. There's this new world, brave new world of DIY fecal transplants, which we have barely bears thinking about uh, in what people are actually up to over there. And this figure that I, uh, I stole from Wikipedia basically I think summarizes where we're at with this, that we've got this hype cycle where microbiome research is being very much hyped up at the moment. We've got this peak of inflated expectations. 
Uh, but people are start uh, are going to get disillusioned if it turns out that most of what we're saying is actually not quite true, um, and it'll take some time before we actually come up the slope of enlightenment, and actually this all becomes a productive and well trusted part of our research and clinical diagnostic and, man and patient management programs for the future. Here's another um, piece that actually uh, applies heavy scepticism to microbiome research. So Bill Hanage wrote this in Nature a few years back. He particularly liked this quote here that I pulled out in pre-scientific times when something happened that people did not understand. They blamed it on spirits. Um, in, the, in the Arab world, you'd call, they'd say they blamed it on the jinn. Um, and what he says is we've got to resist the urge to transform our microbial passengers into modern day phantoms and keep all this stuff real. There's just a couple of uh, satirical uh, blog posts. One is that Trump is trying to ban all microbiome research because he doesn't understand it just as he doesn't understand climate change and many other uh, things that are going on in science today. And then uh, rather satirically also uh, microbiome of wounds is going to be renamed infection because people are trying to hype up the infected wound with its microbiome and they're just talking about wound infections. Now let me finish with a, a, just a quote from this film and a book that came out a few years ago um, where a guy got stuck on, the, on Mars and had to find his way home and one of the key quotes from early on in the book was that he said I'm going to have to science the shit out of this uh, to get himself out of his predicament. What we're going to do if we want to understand the, the, the gut microbiome in particular uh, is we're going to have to science the shit out of shit as our way forward to actually understand what's going on here. And with that perhaps rather profane quote there, for which I apologise if that offends you, I'll pass over now to Andrea who's going to take you through the nuts and bolts of how you actually do this stuff on the command line. Thank you very much.